G'day folks and welcome to our newest episode of MedTech Trailblazers, where we explore the lives of influential pioneers in our MedTech ecosystem, those who have forged a new path for others to follow. Today I have the pleasure of chatting with Hanson Gifford, best known as a co-founder along with Alan Will, Mark Deem and Kara Liebig of The Foundry, a Silicon Valley based enterprise that has blazed a path for many, many successful MedTech companies including Evolve, the company that bought us the MitraClip, Concentric, Ardian, 12, Nuvera, and Foresight Labs. In nearly 40 years, he has been involved with or founded over 30 companies, mentored many of today's medtech leaders, and is now also a venture capital partner at Lightstone Ventures. But that's not what defines Hansen. Hansen has a singular, remarkable creative sense based on his extraordinary depth of knowledge of his craft. He has been called a walking encyclopedia of medtech experiences, innovations, and impact. And of that, I can personally attest. So I could not be happier to welcome my mentor and my good friend, Hanson Gifford, a true medtech trailblazer. Welcome. Andrew, thank you for that uh, overwhelming welcome. So look forward to our discussion. It's going to be fun. All right, Hanson. So let's start with your formative years. So tell us about growing up, your parents, your childhood. What was it like? So I was uh, born just up the road at Stanford University. In fact, uh, I was born in my father's uh, fourth year of medical school, and he had just finished his OBGYN rotation. And so the doctor said, here, Giff, you've, done, you've <laughs> learned how to do this. You deliver the baby. So my no father way. delivered me. Really? Wouldn't be allowed today. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and grew up in Menlo Park, which was just a happy little town at the time. I uh, did a lot of swimming, uh, and um, then when I was uh, seven and a half, we moved east to uh, Long Island for a couple of years, and then to southeastern Massachusetts. So going back, going back, just let's explore your parents. So how yeah. did they influence you? You just said your dad was a neurosurgeon. Father was a, a neurosurgeon, and my mother uh, <coughs> actually uh, had uh, intentions of going to law school, but then um, when uh, kids came along, uh, chose to focus on just being the best mom she possibly could, and she was, uh, just totally dedicated to getting us to every event and you know, running the PTA and all those sorts of things. So uh, we clearly had two parents who really loved all of us, my, myself and my three sisters. And uh, uh, so... Uh, it's a good childhood, I would say. So you said a moment ago you moved up from Menlo Park over to Long Island, but then it seems you also moved to South Dartmouth. Is that right? That's right. Little town uh, along the uh, southeast coast of Massachusetts, which was uh, pretty much of a sailing mecca. And so uh, I spent a number of years growing up where uh, I could just go sailing every day, uh, except in the middle of winter. And uh, that was just a really incredible uh, learning experience, learning to sail, learning to race, but then just having that freedom to go off and sail off across the bay to islands, you know, with friends and, and just be totally independent. And uh, had some hair-raising experiences <laughs> as well, uh, you know, some, some times where we shouldn't have been out there and uh, we sailed in after a crazy day and... Uh, uh, the Coast Guard came in after us. Apparently, they've been out looking for us. But, uh, for how, how long were out there looking for you? Uh, well, we were out all day. We were sailing <laughs> up the coast to a, uh, to a little town uh, 20 miles north uh, for some, some races the following weekend. And, uh, you know, the, the wind went from, uh, you know, a gale to a full gale. <laughs> and you guys didn't notice? Yeah, and there was, you know, three of us, maybe 13 years old, a six-pack of beer. You know, at some point the charts flew overboard. <laughs> it, was, it was entertaining. That explains a lot of your independence today. One of the, the quotes that we had in, when we were having an earlier discussion was getting comfortable in risky and ambiguous situations. That is something that's lived with you through the, the rest of your life. And that's, that's part of the reality of, uh, of starting companies, uh, exactly. is that there's nothing but uncertainty and nothing but risk. And so first step is to stay calm 
And the second step is to figure out how to manage those risks, minimize those risks, and create a team that can, can forge a value in that situation. And, you're, and you genuinely believe that that early experience, being a 12, 13-year-old out in the boat on your own, or uh, with a couple of mates. <clears throat> with friends and, uh, you know, and then sailing up the East Coast and uh, in college sailing uh, from here down to uh, Puerto Vallarta one, one semester. Uh, just, you know, endless experiences of going into new places, facing storms or issues, you know, groundings, mm -hmm. who knows? Things break and you have to figure it out. And so that's uh, a, uh, I think, a good training for, uh, for the challenge of uh, starting companies. Do you still sail? Uh, I do, not as much as uh, I'd like to, but uh, uh, I do sail some. Sailed uh, actually from Bermuda to Newport uh, a couple years ago. It was a great sail. And uh, do a little day sailing uh, uh, up the coast as well. So we also heard sailing is not your only skill. You're also a carpenter. Okay. You know, even <laughs> so we've done some homework here, and that you can build about any, just you can build just about anything, including a boat-shaped treehouse for your kids. Uh, yeah, and building <laughs> things is fun, uh, and especially Andrew, as you know, when you're building a company that is going to take six, eight, ten years to reach the point where your value will be proven or not. Uh, it's really nice to be able to. You know, go out and and cut some wood and put something together, and in one weekend or two, you've you've actually made something, and you can look at it and it's it's done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in a weekend or two, right? It's nice mm -hmm. to have that kind of you know short term thing. Plus, I've just always loved building things. You know, just and design has has always fascinated me. So let's talk next about prep school and college. It sounds like your time at Exeter was very influential in your the future life. Uh, it really was. Uh, up until then, uh, I think school was mostly a uh, struggle against boredom, to be honest. Uh, I don't think I ever took homework home, you know, all the way through ninth grade. And that's not because of any academic prowess. That's <laughs> really just talking about the, the, the schools I was in. And so all of a sudden going to a school where everyone there was smarter than I was and I had to scramble like the Dickens just to keep up uh, was a great experience and uh, a real challenge for me. But uh, keeping up, surviving, succeeding there was, was, uh, was a great experience for me. Uh, that plus just being immersed in an environment where all day long, there's there's a group of friends to do fascinating things with and endless series of things to learn. All right, what was next? Uh, so then I went off to Cornell, uh, where I have to say my academic career was was completely undistinguished. Uh, you know, somebody joked. I think I graduated in the top eighty percent of my class. Uh, but uh, <laughs> congratulations, you beat me <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, but uh, no, I, I <clears throat> you've heard the theme of loving to make things, and so yeah. I really wanted to study engineering. Studied mechanical engineering. My father told me I was supposed to be a doctor, so I took all the pre-med classes. I rode crew. But uh, if you really want to get a sense of my uh, Cornell career, mm -hmm. uh, watch Animal House. Yeah, really? That's <laughs> pretty much it. All right, so which character? It's my favorite you? documentary. <laughs> which character were you? Uh, I'll let you guess. <laughs> we'll put that in the outtakes, I think. Okay. Well, <laughs> no, <why not? laughs> no, my guess, I yeah. think. All right, so from Cornell off to uh, aerospace, I understand. Yeah, so um, one of the things I'd done uh, during my college years was get my uh, pilot's license. I was just totally enchanted with flying, uh, loved all the challenges, all the different things you have to be thinking about at once. And again, you're up flying on your own. Uh, if things go wrong, no one's going to land the plane for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, got a job uh, at General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Texas, where the F-16 was being made. Yeah. And uh, 
that was a good uh, chance to cement my engineering experience because, you know, fantastic engineering and technology being used to make the planes. Um, but um, also just very quickly realized that wasn't going to be a career for me. And so uh, my um, stepmother worked at a little medical device company in Mountain View called Oximetrics. And uh, she arranged for me to talk to the head of R&D, Bob Beard. <laughs> and uh, he um, uh, was kind enough to interview me and sat down and he shared a love of, of planes. He was a uh, private pilot and had built three planes himself. And so we just talked about planes for about two and a half hours. And I kept trying to bring the discussion back to uh, Mr. Beard. Is there any place I might be able to find a job around here? Do you know if anybody was hiring? And at the end of that time, uh, he said, we'll just come back tomorrow and, uh, and I'll hire you. Perfect. So, Good way to start off your career with a, with a, a med tech career, I should say. Exactly. It, yeah. it was great. Uh, and uh, some, uh, some key people. My yeah, first yeah. two people I worked for there were Hira Thapliel, who started many successful companies, uh, and um, uh, John Maroney, who also has led several companies and had a great career as a VC. So tell us about those those years. What was it like working with those guys? I mean, they've gone on. Those two went on to, to great success, as have, have as have you. Yeah. What was it? Uh, well, it was it was totally different from uh, being in a huge aerospace company. Uh, things needed to get done, and so you went and did them and figured it out. And so it was uh, much more of an introduction to the startup experience, even though the company had been around several years and so on. So uh, I was given a lot of responsibility and uh, just had, had a great experience. I was actually only there a year and a quarter, and I was being recruited away to, uh, to <clears throat> one of the uh, American Edwards companies down in Orange County. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hira had, had left shortly there before and, and gone to a little company called DVI, which he started with John Simpson. And uh, so uh, uh, he, uh, he said, no, no, don't, don't go to Orange County. Just stay here and, and come work with us. So, so yeah, so tell us. I mean, DVI comes up a lot. Again, it's one of the. I would have to say it's one of the iconic companies in our in our very young industry. Um, tell us a bit about your time at DVI. Well, I think it it starts with uh, a recognition of uh, how important John Simpson was to my career. Mm -hmm. uh, just a a visionary, a leader, a mentor. Uh, he he really taught me about how to uh, set a goal and work towards it and uh, not get flustered when you know you encounter uh, setbacks and uh, challenges raising money or this or that he just kept going and uh, was utterly confident and uh, hmm. and that led to great success and he still is going and, and he still and, is and still yes. driving and he's still yeah. doing it yeah yeah and, and a series of, of very successful companies since then. But uh, yeah, after uh, a year or so, Alan Will came in as CEO. Uh, we had people like Tom Fogarty on the board. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, was, it was really a great opportunity uh, to try to invent a new, a new product, atherectomy, for cutting plaque out of clogged arteries. So Alan's been a mentor to a lot of us. Absolutely. What, what did you learn from Alan? What did I learned from Alan? Uh, I think uh, just organizational, operational, uh, you know, and, and people skills, getting Cultural. the right people in the right place and building a culture, building a teamwork uh, that, that really is essential to success. You know, I think many of your, your prior guests here have, have pointed out how companies are not about the product, they're about the people, they're about the team, and, and getting the team working together uh, to achieve a goal, any goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you do that right, as, as you have 
that have done so well several times. Uh, it really is a, uh, you yeah. know, you can achieve anything and you can have a really rewarding time to it. Yeah. So at DVI, you know, you, as you said, you're an engineer at DVI, you came in, but you wanted more. So what was next? Yeah, well, I uh, got a chance to really design a product from beginning to end there uh, uh, several times, actually, in different parts of the, of the system. And uh, we were designing, building product, and then sterilizing it, you know, sometimes overnight, and going up to the cath lab at Sequoia and seeing how it worked. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting very quick feedback, very quick iteration of the product, and um, uh, that was fantastic. But after four years on the R&D side, uh, I, uh, I really wanted to have exposure to the rest of the business as well. So I asked Alan and he agreed to uh, put me in clinical research and I went around the country uh, training cardiologists to use the coronary atherectomy catheter and getting their feedback as it went through the, um, the trial. And then as that trial concluded and they were uh, on the verge of uh, uh, FDA approval for the coronary device, uh, I got put in marketing, which uh, was completely, uh, you know, fish out of water experience for me, but uh, a, uh, a really fascinating experience of, of the challenges of uh, connecting a product to the market in so a way that succeeds. So was this deliberate that you were gaining other other looks into other elements of the business? Uh, you... It was. It mm -hmm. was. Yeah, I really wanted to to broaden my experience to understand all the different challenges, and uh, so it's perhaps the only really deliberate career planning I've ever <laughs> done in my life. <laughs> well, the next one's an interesting one. Yeah. Because right, that's that's what I was sort of building to. Were you building to that next job? Uh, so why, why don't you uh, no, describe for no. folks well, the so, next job? So, so the next job, uh, one day John comes to me and he says, you know, I've got a, uh, an idea for a drug delivery catheter. And so I'm going to start a company to do that and I want you to run it. And I was, you know, flattered, honored, terrified uh, that he would... <laughs> think I was ready to do such a thing, but uh, I jumped into it and we started a little company and perhaps very fortunately for me, that was acquired by Lilly slash ACS uh, within a year. Uh, so that group uh, <coughs> continued to become the uh, technology development center within Guidant and then the, the Compass group. Mm -hmm. uh, and my wife and I, uh, we've been married three years. We really wanted to go live overseas. We didn't want to be flat-footed Americans with, with no other experience. And so we, uh, uh, <clears throat> in the DVI years, uh, John Simpson had worked with a, uh, a cardiologist in Munich who really wanted to start a company. And John said, hey, why don't you go over and see about that? And so... Uh, and so I did. And before I know it, uh, the company had been started <laughs> and uh, I was signed up to, uh, to run it. And I really had no business running a company, uh, especially in Germany, in German, which I didn't speak a word of. Uh, so that was a uh, uh, really a crazy experience. Well, you've got, there's a few more things. So the company, what was the company name? Bavaria Medizine Technologie, yeah, uh, yeah. still so going. BMT, still going. It is still going uh, through no, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> no credit to me for that. Uh, it, it survived in spite of anything I I ever did there, and uh, and it was it was just a, a from a business standpoint quite a struggle mm -hmm. to build up a catheter production company from scratch there. Uh, but at the same time, we also had the experience of living in Germany, learning the language, making new friends there. Uh, our first daughter was born there. So it was, it was really, you know, at the end of the day, 
powerful growing experience for me and for my wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for your new family, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, um, uh, but at the end of that, it was time to come home and mm -hmm. <laughs> back to a, a slightly saner, safer environment. Which was? Which was Hartport. Yeah. So I'm not... At, at the time known as Stanford Surgical Technologies. Okay. Would you still call it a slightly saner environment? Uh, it, it, uh, it started off saner. Yeah. And uh, as the company grew in its... Uh, complexity. Yeah. As that? the company grew in its complexity and its aspirations and became the less invasive cardiac surgery company, uh, went public in 1996 with a billion dollar valuation, which was actually fairly rare back then, mm -hmm. uh, not today. Uh, it was a, uh, a very hectic, uh, complicated business, actually. Uh, and, and your role but, then was... But my role was, was VP of R&D, mm -hmm. and that was fantastic. Yeah, at, at the peak, we had over 60 engineers and technicians in the R&D department working on two dozen different projects. And we made some really great things that are still in use today, being mm -hmm. sold by Edwards Laboratories uh, to, uh, to perform less invasive uh, heart surgery. What were the lessons? Tell, tell me the lessons you got. That was, a, that was, again, a remarkable experience, you know, the hard port days. You know, we hear a lot about it today. So what, what lessons did you walk away with? Well, one was uh, when the company was started, uh, it actually was started to uh, create Taver. Uh, yeah. And somehow in the early days, the company evolved from uh, Taver to less invasive uh, open heart surgery with uh, cardiac isolation and bypass and so on. Uh, so, so the Taver project was going on in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, one thing was just saying, we don't know what less invasive heart surgery is, but we're going to invent it and create it. And we've done that a few more times. <laughs> uh, for instance, with 12, saying yeah. we don't know what we're going to do, uh, how we're going to do it, but we're going to create a uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement company. I like that. Going back to the TAVA connection, yeah. Just prior to going to Hartport, you were working with a venture firm doing a little bit of diligence. Mm -hmm. And you were the guy who, who noticed the Anderson patents. Um, I, I did. Uh, I did diligence for uh, one of the investors in Hartport just before I went to Germany. Mm -hmm. And saw those patents and I said, boy, you know, Taver is, Taver is going to be really challenging. I bet that's going to take 10 years. Uh, it's only off by about 10 years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it'll be hugely valuable and is worth doing. And uh, yeah, here's here's one piece of IP you might want to look at. Yeah, which became, it's the pivotal IP. Hey guys, just a quick note on the Anderson patents. Uh, if you don't know, they were the seminal IP that formed the foundation for the development of uh, Tabby, you know, one of the, the most uh, important developments in medtech for, for decades. I think what we wanted to note here was that Hansen had actually seen the value of this IP well before anyone else uh, and uh, had actually recommended to Harpo that they acquire the IP as they subsequently did. The foundry, uh, which uh, Cara reminds us, uh, you were born to lead. <laughs> you were put, or quote, you were put on this earth to run this company. So tell us about the, found, the founding of the foundry. So <clears throat> the foundry uh, is really the brainchild of Alan Will. He deserves all the credit. He had, uh, after DVI, done a few different things, but uh, most notably created Enurex along mm -hmm. with Tom Fogarty, which had gone on to be very successful and is still the basis mm -hmm. for a huge franchise for Medtronic in uh, AAA grafting. After that, he circled back to an idea that he had talked about back in the DVI days, which was to create an incubator that could create several new companies so that they could leverage the, the strengths of, of people across a range of companies. And uh, I had frankly been very skeptical of that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it seemed to me very important, one of the key success factors of startups is the focus. Focusing in on one idea and having everybody committed to making that successful. And uh, there have been a number of incubators that have you know, eight different projects, each of which is mediocre, and, and that gets you nowhere. Mm-hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> but after the chaos, if you will, of being in Germany and being at Hartport, uh, I knew that I really wanted to work with people who I could absolutely trust and who had a really good sense of, uh, of building businesses. And that was Alan Will. So I was thrilled that he invited me to come work with him, jumped at the chance, said, I don't know how this is going to work, but let's just put one foot in front of another and see how it goes. And started in uh, the the (coughs) guest cottage at my house. And after six months, uh, brought in Carol Liebig to help run the books. She had been at Anurex with Alan. And uh, he said, we have to get her. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, brought in Mark Deem, who had arrived at DVI actually just after I left. Uh, and uh, the first thing he did was set us up with a facility, but uh, very quickly evolved into uh, really my partner in crime, the two of us uh, identifying and cooking up new ideas to, uh, to start companies. So how, tell us about the model. So uh, the model has been through a lot of iterations, mm-hmm. but the I think the the common element is one great company at a time. Identifying lots of ideas, but picking the one best idea and, and forming a company to, uh, to develop that. Uh, putting the best team we can around it, the best uh, financial backing, and setting up a plan, making sure it gets off to the best start it can. And only when it is in good hands and, and rolling forward, do we start to look at the next one? And what, yeah, what's that cycle time, do you think? So uh, over 23 years, we've started, I think, 19 companies at the Foundry and mm-hmm. several more at Foresight Labs, so roughly one a year. Uh, but it varies. Sometimes it takes a lot longer. Yeah. Sometimes they, they come a little faster. And we've been through various financial models. You know, sometimes funding one company at a time, raising money before you've even picked an idea, Mm -hmm. but then also sometimes having the idea and going out and raising money for it. In the early days, we raised a small fund and just started as many companies as we could with that money. You guys had a a base, had a relationship with, with a group or a syndicate of VCs. How did you establish that? Uh, you know, we've, I think we've worked with 40 different VCs at least mm-hmm. uh, at different companies over the years, and uh, different people have different uh, focuses at one time and another. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we were very fortunate that, uh, among others, Morgan Thaler Ventures and Advanced Technology Ventures funded. Uh, our companies multiple times and we really seem to be aligned in our ideas on on what companies might be most successful and so uh, when the life sciences groups from those two uh, firms joined to form Lightstone uh, it seemed uh, natural that that we would form an even closer relationship Mm -hmm. with with Lightstone which has been been great I think for both both entities. Thank you for watching the first episode in our MedTech Trailblazer series with Hanson Gifford. I hope you enjoyed learning about some of his formative experiences, both personally and professionally, and got a taste of why the Foundry is so special. Please watch for episode two, where we'll drill deeper into the Foundry and ask Hanson to share wisdom about our industry and his own beliefs about the future. Please like this content on social media and share this episode with your network. Till the next one, cheers.